This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. During the age of social distancing, we're recording remotely and releasing new episodes every day. Today's guest is drummer, guitarist, vocalist, and songwriter Meg Baird. Meg began her musical journey playing with her sister Laura in what would become known as the Baird Sisters. She moved to Philadelphia in 1995 and played in bands such as Espers, Hair and Oblivion, and Watery Love. Since 2007, Meg has released a stunning series of solo albums that showcase her uniquely compelling and haunting songcraft. In 2018, Meg collaborated with harpist and trap set alumnus Mary Lattimore on the critically acclaimed duo album Ghost Forests. Meg spoke to me from her home in San Francisco. Hello. Hi, Meg. How have you been? Oh, I mean, I can't complain <laughs> personally, but yeah. <laughs> how about you? How are you? How are you faring? I'm faring pretty well. I, I mean, mm-hmm. luckily, my life, my personal life, hasn't been severely impacted by this pandemic, so I feel lucky. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in the same boat. Very worried about people I know people I don't know (laughs) but um you know I'm I'm fine (laughs) so what have you been doing with your time um I mean it is honestly my day isn't terribly different um I had some tours canceled and some studio dates canceled um um so that that creates some extra time um been you know working on some some projects I didn't think I would be working on uh, I'm spending a lot of extra time uh, communicating with people too which is I guess something nice um, to do with that little bit of extra time that comes from being at home and having you know some some stuff canceled yeah I've I've felt like it's um, making me appreciate relationships that I have with people and uh reach out yeah it it has it's um it has been nice to you know just be able to get in touch with people that maybe you're sort of in touch with (laughs) um you know that kind of thing um uh calling calling my mom every day which is which is nice I think I'll keep doing that though (laughs) <laughs> does your mom seem concerned about all of this um of course she is um she's in new jersey so that's especially stressful um for me but you know she's she's doing fine same you know she's being very cautious and has everything she needs so lots of people's parents don't seem that concerned She's pretty concerned. She's she has a pretty scientific mind, so I think she was um, she was kind of uh, following along with the news um, from the get go. So, where in New Jersey did you grow up? In Burlington, which is it's in South Central Jersey, South Jersey. It's in the 
more in the orbit of Philadelphia, not New York. So, which is a big distinction <laughs> for a tiny state. <laughs> yes. But it, they, are, they are quite different New Jerseys. So. What are some of your earliest memories? Oh, some of my earliest memories. Um, you know, those, I guess, it would just be time around the house. Um, my, my mom still lives in the house that I grew up in. Um, so I think I do remember yard. Um, I guess those, those distinctions between inside and outside, uh, you know, in, in a house that you've, you've spent a long time in. I remember, so the earliest, um, I remember being afraid of uh, tumble, like those tiny tumbleweeds that used to come across from the field <laughs> across the street. I don't know. I'm sure I have other early memories too, but um, that's that's one that comes to mind. From yeah, lots of people's uh, early memories have to do with a fear. I guess. Yeah, I think that's how yeah. we're wired. Uh huh. I mean, I think I probably have other ones too. It's just something that um, you know, pleasant. <laughs> plus early memories as well but uh, I do remember I remember crawling I, I have this kind of like point of view memory of crawling uh, on the floor um, but maybe that was also maybe I banged my head or something I don't know <laughs> what kind of music was on in your house when you were growing up uh, growing up it was um, well, we had instruments, so there was live music as well. Um, Did your parents play? My father played. Um, his primary instrument was trombone. So there was a lot of trombone. He had classical guitar around that he would play a bit. And we had a piano. Um, I actually... Um, so we had, you know, toy, sort of semi-toy instruments around, uh, record, recorders and percussion instruments. I actually had a toy drum set, which um, Was I that had. your I, first instrument? It, um, I doubt. I mean, I think I was just playing on the things that I was allowed to touch, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everything. But I do, I do remember the, um, breaking the kick and then... Like just you know going right through it uh, with the with, with the tiny kick drum, you know with a tiny kick pedal and um, you have a heavy foot. It, yeah, but and then it went away. <laughs> oh, you just <laughs> I, saw it again. I, th I think it was broken. I was probably playing a bit a bit more uh, frantically than maybe it was pretty annoying. That's what I'm guessing in retrospect. <laughs> so it just I broke it and then it. Instead of getting repaired, it just kind of went away. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of to toys, and, and we could play. Some of the instruments were fine. Most of them actually were fine to play. Um, there's a, and some of them were kind of like flea market instruments. Like a, I remember there was an old, um, some horns. Um, but yeah, we couldn't, there's a couple things we could, we couldn't play, you know, touch my dad's trombone for obvious reasons. Did your mom play an instrument as well? Um, no, she didn't. You said she, she has a scientific mind. Is she a scientist? Oh, she's not, but, um, she was a teacher and that's, you know, that's just kind of how her mind works. She's, um, she pro- Pro science, I guess. <laughs> um, and but she she had been a teacher. My dad worked in um, technology, and so it was it wasn't like a big issue around the house. But it, I guess it does sort of influence your family culture, you know. Was there music on, like records on, or would, would you oh, mostly yeah. just play? There was a lot. My I get you know at that point it would be my dad's collection. Um, he was. You know, kind of like classical jazz. Um, you know, kind of like the big hits, I'd say, <laughs> of, of, of the classical world. Um, and, and he liked, um, 
he had a, a bit of a pension for like some of the Bossa Nova kind of stuff. Um, you know, the bigger, there's some of the bigger hits there, but um, that, that was a big one. He really liked chords. So um, I think. It's interesting uh, because he played a non chordal instrument. Mm -hmm. But you find your chords, you know, yeah. when you're, when you play ensemble music, you're still kind of making them. So, but yeah, that's, that there was, there was a lot of that. And then with my sister is, is quite a bit older than I am too. So there would be a point where I was probably paying a lot of attention to her record collection and what she was playing too. So, um, and you and your sister have a band together. Yeah, we do. The Occasional, sisters. but yeah, <laughs> sort of a life project. <laughs> We're not, we haven't put anything out for a while. We're really far apart right now, but we would like to do another, another record at some point. So how much older is your sister? Uh, she's seven years older. And what kind of records were in her collection that spoke to you? I mean, I think it was with, cause we didn't really have, my dad didn't listen to rock music or pop much pop at all. Like, um, so I think anything, you know, Laura having, um, you know, at that point, just, you know, some kind of classic stuff. Um, you know, I'm sure that's where I was hearing Joni Mitchell, some Jethro Tull she had. She had a lot of Rush records. I think she, um, there, there was a lot of Rush going on. <laughs> um, and, yeah, you know, and the big classics, you know, like the Zeppelin stuff. And, um, you know, I think it, it probably was a little bit on the 70s classic rock side, but probably the folkier, earthier um, side of that. Yeah, and it just, we were, you know, kind of a musical family. We just played together. Um, it started with the lessons pretty early. I guess I was six with piano lessons. Um, so, yeah, you just, it just sort of happens. It's not, um, you know, it's kind of like just something done at home. And Did you like piano lessons? I liked playing the piano. I was not a very good student. I wasn't a terrible student. <laughs> just a kind of frustrating middle of the road <laughs> Um, student, I really liked the instrument and hanging out with it, but um, I wasn't one of those disciplined practice, practicing, you know, practicing was a challenge. Uh, reading was a challenge. Going to lessons and feeling guilty every week after week about how you didn't practice very much <laughs> was a challenge. Uh, but I never wanted, I didn't want to quit. I mean, it just wasn't a a model student there, but I'm really thankful I stuck with it. If you were going to teach music lessons to a six-year-old, yeah. what would your approach be? I, I may have benefited from, ha you know, just being able to experiment a little more to, to kind of get off the grid of, of just reading and performing, like all notation and all technique, because I play so much by ear. And which can be a, an advantage, but it, um, I found it to be a disadvantage because it was making reading really hard. And um, I think I, I kind of just wanted to explore sounds and, you know, that kind of thing with the piano. And uh, a more formal education doesn't give you, let you do that as much. That's something that comes up a lot with people that come on this show. They fall into a pattern of feeling guilty and, and, you know, learning by ear and not being particularly disciplined when they're six years old. But most six-year-olds mm -hmm. aren't. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it did follow me all the way to high school, the lack of discipline. <laughs> but I, I always liked playing it. But um, I, mean, I think I, you know, I, there's a lot to learn. So I understand the, you know, the challenge to get, to get kids reading and, and all of that, but yeah, I I think some of my best memories with the piano are just playing at night, you know, off of practice time and just 
you know, getting getting a chance to um, just hear the hear all the tones and stuff like that. I think that was probably a little more interesting to me. And maybe if I hadn't had been a better student and had learned enough theory, I I may have been able to go more into a jazz realm or something at, at some point. But it just I just stopped taking lessons <laughs> instead. You can always take lessons again if you really wanted to. Yeah, I could someday. I would I would really like a piano. I kind of it's been a, a little bit of a fixation just over the last year that um it would be really fun to live with a piano again. Do it's you have been space a really, really long time. Uh no. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> it it wouldn't work now, but um it it would be a nice nice thing to have sometime. Um, to you know, actually live with one again. It's I haven't lived with a piano in a very very long time. <laughs> when did you start writing songs? Mm, probably like at the end end of high school. Um, my sister had one of the uh, had a a four track tape recorder and she got quite good with it and so of course I kind of snuck in there too and um, and we would do stuff together or sometimes I would just you know write some stuff alone but it didn't turn into a a huge undertaking like okay I'm gonna write songs now just but that's that's around when I started to write also when I started that's also the same time where I started to conquer um playing the guitar a little bit you said that you were undisciplined throughout high school mm -hmm. did that extend to learning guitar um yeah well we have it at home so um I was able to pick it up my father was also self-taught but had you know he had some a pretty good foundation um he it was a classical guitar so I think that's why I immediately went to more of a finger style um so I think he taught me a tiny bit really not lessons but just kind of got me started on a few chords and and such, and, um, you know, and at that point, um, he wasn't really that interested in the music that I was listening to, too, so it, it wasn't like any kind of a fight or anything, we just weren't, you know, we kind of had different things that we wanted to do with the guitar. What were you so, listening to at the time? Um, I mean, at that point, you know, I think I'd find, kind of gotten into the, the college ra radio orbit um you know by probably by the end very end of high school so um and just um and again that, that sort those sort of foundations like those classics the classic stuff that i still like a lot that um was pretty accessible probably especially neil young at that point i think i really wanted to learn neil young songs on the guitar when I first started learning chords, um, and they were also um, pretty accessible too. So, uh, for someone that's just you know figuring stuff out. And when you started writing songs, it didn't feel like you were completing some sort of monumental task. It was just kind of a, a thing to do with your sister's four track. Yeah, it, it was just something to do, and I think I was enjoying the simplicity of it. I wasn't trying to, you know, learn all kinds of crazy chords or, do, you know, it was just, it was very natural, kind of the opposite of like a formal, formal music lessons or something like that. So. How did it feel? I would say just really natural. It's just, Looking back, it just wasn't, it was just really fun and a really natural thing to do. And it was also just time spent with my sister. We're very close. So 
Uh, it just felt, I mean, a little bit like work, um, but yeah, that's, it's a very, very happy memory. Um, that time when we were living near each other and, and doing a lot of music together. After high school, what was your next step? Um, then it was college, I guess. My college band days. <laughs> um, Why are you laughing? I don't know. It just feels funny to, to timeline it. <laughs> um, and Did it feel like timelined in the moment? <laughs> like, did you feel like, all right, now I'm on the track to go to college. I'm going to college. I think, I think there is, you know, you know, especially at that time, I don't know. I think that it's, I doubt this is very, the same thing now, but uh, when I went to college, you know, when you find your, I mean, the, when college radio was such a force at that point, and um, yeah, then you meet people who are into, you know, music that's, you know, where I went to high school, I def there definitely wasn't a core of like music nerd or whatever type type people <laughs> in my, um, from my, my peers and friends at school. So it did feel kind of like a, a new phase, finding underground music, college music, um, and kind of connecting all those dots, um, between some of the music that I was, uh, you know, that I was just discovering or finding I had a really strong attachment to. Um, I especially remember uh, that's around the time, too, that I was getting more interested into in some of the Appalachian music and folk music and and being able to make that connection between drone, like drone music that I was hearing from some um, more like underground type music and making that connection um, probably, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably still kind of coming out of that, out of that place <laughs> in some ways, making those, making those connections. So did you find kindred spirits when you went to college? Oh yeah, that was that was a lot easier <laughs> than in high school. Where did you go to school? I went to Rutgers in New Jersey, in New Brunswick. Were you involved with college radio while you were there? You no, know, I wasn't. I think I was a bit too shy. Um, but I I knew people that had shows and and did programming, so I felt I felt semi involved or at least around it. But I wasn't doing anything myself. What were you studying in school? Um, English, English lit, Russian minor. Oh, so how's your <laughs> Russian? It's terrible now. I have never used it. <laughs> but I guess it comes in handy once in a while. I could probably relearn it. Did you but read the classics in Russian? I never quite got that far. I think I was reading, laboriously reading uh, works that were kind of abridged for students with a dictionary. Um, so I could sort of read, but I, I never got to a point where I could really be literate. And um, even reading Russian newspaper or, you know, it was a challenge. I could kind of, I could get through it with a dictionary, but it was, it was pretty bad in my writing, same thing. A little bit not that great. <laughs> now it's just gone. <laughs> did so, you ever go to Russia? I never did. It was sort of the plan, but it, it just never never materialized. And Yeah, guess, at one point I thought it would be cool to be able to learn how to read the classics in their native mm -hmm. tongue. So I went to a Rush I signed up for a Russian class at um a university, like an extension type thing, because uh -huh. it, was, it was after I was in college. And I went one day, and then the next day I got asked to go on tour with Mary Timoney, so I dropped out of the class. But I still <laughs> remember how to ask people what their name is, and I know how to say fish, 
uh-huh. meatball, and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that's that's a good. <laughs> that could help you out, I guess. Did you have any ambitions when you were in school or dreams? Um. Well, I guess this long pause probably <laughs> probably makes me not look too ambitious. But I'm, I'm sure I did. I think I, in some way, wanted, it was very vague, but I knew that I wanted uh, art or music or, or something related to this exciting new world that I'd found in college and academia to be a part of my life. Um, I didn't really have, I didn't really feel like I was grad school material or anything. I didn't mean, I don't mean academia in that way, like a really intense um, academic um, life. But, um, you know, I did, I did really, I really enjoyed my time in college. And I guess that was my dream is just to, to be able to find a way to sustain myself and and keep some of those things going. That's part of my life. So what did you do next? Uh, next, I had just like a really boring cubicle job for a while, reselling software components <laughs> to third-party <laughs> vendors. Or some, I don't even really software remember components. what I did. Or something. Yeah, I, well, it was just software packages. It was back in the day where um, there were these really intense licensing, like, and corporations would have to buy license packs. And um, I don't even remember what I did, but it was, I guess I was happy to have the job. That was another recession back then, I guess. I was like, okay, I guess. And that, um, didn't go that didn't really lead to a career <laughs> but you know I just did what I was supposed to do I finished my degree and I was supposed to try and get a job so I did it <laughs> how did it feel at the time like what were you happy to be working and then have did you have time to work on music or was it so crushing <laughs> Uh, I didn't really love it, but it was, I don't know, it just felt like I was doing what I had to do. Um, and I still lived in my college town um, and had a band, too. We weren't doing that much, but... Um, was that Espers? No, this was before Espers. Um, we were a couple different names. Uh, the last name, I think, was called Grace and Lane. And we didn't play much. I think we got up to the Pyramid Club once or twice in New York. And some New Brunswick shows. We were okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, it was like, but it, it was fun. Um, so I was working on that. Um, you know, if you're kind of in New Brunswick, there's a, there's a thing. Are you going to move to Philly or are you going to move to New York or just do something else and um, you know a lot of people moved to New York that were in the band and I moved to Philly how come? Uh, I, um, I think it just it just spoke to me more there um New York looked pretty exciting, but it was, you know, the idea—I, the idea of just like all that space and people were, that was available in Philadelphia um, was really appealing, you know. So instead of just like cramming into some tiny apartment, et cetera, et cetera, like people are living in you know, bigger spaces with a lot more freedom, a lot less, you know, financial stress. So I was, you know, kind of attracted to that. And then once you were in Philly, you started joining bands. Yep. What was the first one? 
Uh, the first one I joined in Philly uh, was a band called Clock Strikes 13. That band, I played keyboards and sang. And it was a band that it had a pretty, like a kind of a rotating cast. Um, it was a person, Ben Kim. It was sort of his band and, you know, people kind of circulated through. Um, but I... I was one of the female singer, keyboard player, <laughs> female voiced um, singer, but it was, it was fun. I was really looking for something to do. And it, by doing that, it actually, that's how I met Brooke. So I guess it kind of um, turned into, you know, it got me to a place where I, where, Esp you know, it was a very different kind of band, but it, it got me to the place where Esper started. So what did Espers represent to you? Um, Espers, I mean, I like playing music and I, I really liked playing in Clock Strikes 13, but it wasn't, they weren't my songs and I liked the music, and it, but it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to be doing. Um, I met, with Espers, it was, it was like I really wanted to be making that music and uh, also, you know, felt like I could really contribute as well, not just, you know, sort of perform a part with a little bit of, you know, some of my input, but it really was a band and that I would be a member of, so. Were you writing your own songs this whole time, too? Here and there, um, I think I'd always been writing them, but i not prolific, no. And I didn't really have an outlet for them anyway. <laughs> and I was still doing work, you know, the work with my sister never stopped, even though it's up and down. We were still doing that. Um, and actually, that was getting a lot more active. When I, That's another way that I met Espers as well. Like, the music that Espers was playing, the music, you know, the music that my sister and I played um, was very hard to find the right kind of family or setting for and um, when Espers was forming it was really nice because I felt um, you know they kind of there, there was a, a community of musicians that kind of got what we were doing a little more so uh, but it, it was very exciting playing in Watery Love around 2008, but I definitely didn't sing. That band was way too loud anyway. I had to wear those. That's That was like a foam earplug type band. <laughs> um, so loud. But I didn't do any of the singing, just drumming. And had that been the first time you'd really played drums since the toy drum set as a kid? Um, yeah. I mean, I would play... Um, kind of just mess around on a kit just for fun learn to learn how to play a little bit so I had separation and some basics you know just so that I could um, slightly play a kit but that's all I that's all the only foundation I had before that band and they Richie and Max who are also in the band I think they definitely had a vision of being fairly simple drums. So that was, so I, I wound up playing really simple drums. <laughs> with Earlier you mentioned that you didn't have 
an outlet for your own songs, but then uh-huh. at some point you just created one and started working as a solo artist. What was the impetus to do that? Um, you know, that came about a lot more externally. Um, just a few people were asking me to, to do things like, Oh, would you like to play a solo show? Um, and yeah, it actually came from being asked if I wanted to do something uh, just as a as a solo project rather than as part of the the bands I was in. And I'm not sure that I was dying to do it until people asked me to. So I am probably more of a natural collaborator than a solo artist but I do like singing and singing my own songs and and playing them too and um, but yeah I would have to say I was probably just sort of asked into it (laughs) did it feel exciting in a new way once you started doing it Uh, it was it was challenging Um, well I didn't realize how nervous I would be performing in front of other people by myself, even though I wasn't, I didn't actually have any stage fright. I'm a relatively shy person, but as you know, I said, like playing music is so natural. I don't really have a big issue, like playing music is very natural, but playing by yourself, you get, uh, I, I tended to get just sort of an adrenaline, like a, just a physical reaction of nerves that I wasn't used to. And it uh, made playing really difficult. Um, and I think once I realized that I had that issue, I just wanted to try and move through it, see if I could get better at playing in front of people and work through that kind of, a, you know, kind of control my adrenaline and, and nerves so that I could perform better. I, I'm not sure. I, I still have it a tiny bit. I mean, I, I definitely feel like I'm, when I'm on stage, I'm not usually, pl- perf- you know, I feel pretty like underperforming just because of adrenaline. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I feel like I work through it. But, I guess that's not really exciting or fun. It's sort of a challenge, but it's kind of what kept me going. <laughs> well, when <laughs> you, know? you say you're underperforming, you mean like you're just trying your best to relax? Mm, um, or just that if I were, if I weren't nervous, that I would be able to play much better, more fluidly, far fewer, you know, the little micro errors. And I just get, I tend, you know, I just not playing as well. I mean, I guess most people have to, you know, the bridge between how they play at practice or at home isn't necessarily how they're playing live, but mine is, is, it's pretty pronounced (laughs) sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. How, Um, how aware of that kind of stuff are you when you're playing? Very, when it's just me, (laughs) when it's just guitar and me, um, how, but, how judgmental are you of yourself? Uh, I'm probably qu- quite judgmental, but at the same time, I, I let myself off the hook. I'm not, um, I kind of walk both sides of the line <laughs> that way. Yeah. You know, I don't like, it's kind of, I'm being hard on myself, but at the same time, I'm also like, hey, that was just the performance, you know, you're just, playing what you can play right now so I don't have a hard time just uh, dealing with what's happening and doing your best with what's happening and trying to to do that but um, yeah there's a lot of mean thoughts going on (laughs) too (laughs) I'm sure I don't stay there though it's not it's not um, I try and just let it go and move on so do you think that that critical voice or the mean thoughts are productive in any way um i 
it's pro it's it is good to be able to review what you've done and and figure out what to do what you might want to do better or just to literally just learn something from it um they don't have to be mean thoughts though <laughs> they could also they could be they could be anything right um, so i i would say that that part is not not productive however yeah but engaging in self-criticism is is productive but yeah you can sort of i probably running with it into mean thoughts is probably not <laughs> how has your songwriting process evolved over the years from when you were working with a cassette four track and i don't want to be presumptuous maybe you still use a cassette four track i don't i i think um that, that's actually probably more sophisticated. <laughs> I think now I, I probably have record too many iPhone voice memo demos. Yes. <laughs> but as we all tend to do, the glut of of like half baked ideas. Um, I think um, probably what's changed is um, it, it less less immediacy. I mean, I would actually like to be able to do more home recording because I, I think I tend to get stuck in, um, okay, well, this is an idea that could be a song. Um, back in the four track days, though, it was, you moved really quickly and you started, you started getting your songs down just as soon as they were written. Um, and, and you <laughs> also don't have infinite tape in the way that you can record, <laughs> no. you know, nearly infinite amounts of ideas yeah on a phone well, mm -hmm. but well you said I, there's like a glut of half-baked ideas but when do you how do you make the decision to fully bake an idea <laughs> you know like how do you know that you're going to pursue an idea and finish it it's usually um either i'm really it's usually deadline oriented or I'm just very, very interested in something that's happened. Uh, but usually it's, I have a show and I really want to try some new things. So there's a deadline or when I decide that it's time to record and I have to gather up the material and, and just, you know, go through the process of, of figuring out what, what I want to finish. Um, but a lot of times it's it's just the feeling of like oh, I just really need need or want to have some new things to play for a, for a show. What do you think about most throughout the day? <laughs> um, I guess I'm kind of just going along with the with the day, with a pretty elaborate to-do list, long-term projects, getting through the day, what I'm going to cook for dinner, you know, just just like the immediate day-to-day -day mixed with a really, just, just spacing out into my long-term ideas, which are these days usually always about music and music I want to make and yeah so it's just keeping that keeping those two threads in a into a sort of cohesive life <laughs> into a nice brain <laughs> yeah you're just like because there's this day-to-day -day existence and survival and then um it's just your expansive imagination and and just yeah, trying to get those two things to fit okay, and not not damage each other <laughs> too much. It's hard. It is hard, yeah. Especially because you can you can feel selfish for indulging the the big thoughts too much, um, and vice versa. You know, you don't want to get too caught up in the survival and day to day that it's taking too much away from you know your your dreamy, stretchy, big-term thought, big, big thoughts. 
so. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a constant balancing act. Mm -hmm. What factored into the decision to move to the Bay Area? Uh, that was, was for my my partner Charlie, because we were he's we were long distance for a couple of years, and we had to pick Philadelphia or San Francisco. So, and Charlie is also in Hair and Oblivion, so he plays guitar. And that's the band that you do sing and play drums in. That is the one, yes. <laughs> and that happened out here. Does playing drums while you're singing have an effect on the melodies that you come up with? I'm sure it does. Um, some of that might be more volume and just kind of where they sit more than the actual way they move around. Um, so I guess that's kind of a roundabout answer, but, you know, just when you're in a louder band, you know, you're just finding a, very, a really different place for melody. But rhythmically, I don't think it... I must. I mean, it must change, but not in a way that I notice terribly. What do you have going on creatively at the moment? Well, I am working on another solo record. Um, so I guess I, I culled through all those those horrible iPhone demos and finally decided what to record. And it's kind of stall. I was about to mix it before um, stay, at place, stay Shelter in Place orders came through. So I don't know. I don't know when I'll be able to finish it, but well, at least it's, you got it's the going. actual yeah. songs written and recorded. That's the <laughs> yeah. harder part. Yeah, so it's it's hanging out there, um, and I was able to play piano and drums a little bit on this record, which is exciting because I never played drums on my own songs before. How did it so, feel? It was really fun. It was. Um, it felt kind of like a a long time coming, in a funny way. <laughs> it was like, oh wow, this. I may, you know, this is kind of funny that this is what's happening now after all, all this time spent in music, kind of randomly because you know I'm not like I said I'm not a studios player. I'm kind of all over the place, here and there, but. It was kind of cool. Did it feel easier to lock in with yourself when you were overdubbing? Because you have the exact same sense of rhythm as your drummer? I was, it may have. I was trying to see if that was, if that was really happening, but um, I'm not sure that I'm that kind of drummer. So, um, but hopefully there's, you know, some, some of that intuitive, hopefully that comes through, but um, probably where it would come through the most is my guitar playing, I guess, feeling and, and piano, I guess just, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a magical experience. It was just really cool. <laughs> um, but you know, I don't. I don't know that it it had that effect to to any sort. Um, you know, I've done a lot of overdubbing, um, and and it kind of works. But I feel like it's really voices that that get that. Um, where you know the there's so much alignment going on sonically and that it it just gives it that expansive quality you know when you have like the same voice multiplied and even when it's like two parts and they um have all that like harmonic goodness between them even when they're slightly off but um yeah i don't i don't think that's what happened with the drumming but it was still fun to be to be my own drummer <laughs> 
What are you cooking for dinner tonight? You know, I'm going to I'm going to look through my my pantry <laughs> and see. I'm not quite sure. Are I you might the kind, try Are you good at improvising recipes out of whatever yeah, you have? Yeah. That's that's kind of, I like to do that. Um and because it's just so random what's you know what I was able to get we're really not going to the the store um as unless we have to and I have these could I, I somehow managed to get these I think it's pronounced fideo noodles they're used in paellas I've never cooked them before so I guess I guess I'll be learning about this this new type of pasta. <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up. I, yeah. I, I, Cooked in sofrito. I think it used sofrito, which I have. I, I managed to have a jar of sofrito in my fridge. So I'll, I'm going to see how to connect the dots between the one I have. <laughs> well, Meg, so. thank you so much for being on the oh, show thank today. You. Yep. Th thank you. <laughs> Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs>